All right, folks are still trickling in here, but uh, I think we'll get started. So my name is Dr. Ina Park. For those of you who don't know me by now, I'm the medical director here at the California Prevention Training Center, and I am so excited to bring you the next in our STD Expert Hour series. Um, this time we are speaking with Bethany Young-Holt uh, about new frontiers in STI prevention and family planning, the promise of multipurpose prevention technologies. But before I get into Dr. Youngholt's impressive CV, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about our center, if my slides will advance, the California Prevention Training Center, which has brought you this event today. So we are a multidisciplinary training and technical assistance and capacity building center. This is our logo. We are funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we are part of a larger network um, of the National Network of Clinical STD Prevention Training Centers, which is here. And you'll see that um, we cover you know, all 50 states as well as the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico and provide training and technical assistance in the areas of HIV prevention, um, STD diagnosis and treatment as well. So for those of you who are on this call who see clients or patients where a um, confusing or difficult clinical consultation might come up, I wanted to let you know that our national network offers a online consultation center with each region answering the questions in their region. It's at stdccn.org. We encourage you to um, please send your consults to us and we are happy to help you. We have to show you some financial disclosures from um, our accrediting board, the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine. And so that is our financial disclosure here. And uh, we have you know, presented all disclosures related to the speakers as well as the um, myself as well. We have nothing to disclose. And um, again, this is our CME disclosure as well, the standard language that we need to show you before uh, this training. And so all of you registered for this webinar on the National Network of Prevention Training Centers website. So the webinar much, must be watched live. Um, of course, you can watch the recording after the fact, but to get CME credit, you need to watch the entire webinar live. And um, we do have note of attendance, and so that is cross-referenced to ensure um, that the folks who attend live are able to get CME credit. So this is really important part of the housekeeping, please, please complete your post-course survey evaluation by July 1st. So all of you will get a link within 24 hours from Elizabeth Olson, who's our program manager um, at ucsf.edu. And um, please add this email address to your safe senders. And if you don't see it within 24 hours, uh, please check your, um, your junk uh, folders because it might be in there. But be rest, rest assured, we are sending an evaluation to everybody who is registered. And um, again, you will uh, be sent your uh, CME certificate from the University of Nevada, Reno in approximately four to six weeks. And um, again, if I check your spam and junk folders because sometimes they go there. And then of course, if you do have questions, I'm gonna give you um, Elizabeth Olson's email at the end. But again, please um, you know, be patient, your certificate is coming. And um, if you do have questions, then email Elizabeth. So here's some uh, Zoom webinar tools. So your speaker and microphone and video are going to be off as a participant during this video. The chat feature is off. However, the Q&A feature is on. So any questions, please send them to us. I am going to be curating them throughout and uh, I will be asking Bethany the questions at the end. So please ask us your questions um, when, you, when they strike you in the moment during the webinar. And um, just a little bit more to show you exactly what that panel looks like. I think everyone who's been on Zoom by now many times knows, but um, up until the last two minutes of the talk, you can submit your questions and we will either answer them live or um, if there's something that's a more of a housekeeping question that I can answer in the q and I will do so. So again, I mentioned for questions, um, if there's an issue with your CME certificate or um, any questions related to the housekeeping, please email Elizabeth Olson. You'll see her email below. It's Olson with an O-N, not an E-N. And so now without further ado, it brings me great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague, Bethany Young-Holt. Uh, Dr. Holt is the founder and executive director of CAMI Health which is dedicated to advancing the health of women and girls worldwide. And she's also the co-founder of the Initiative for Multipurpose Prevention Technologies, which is what we're talking about today. And uh, it is the 
you know, products that combine HIV prevention, STI prevention, and or contraception. Dr. Young Holt has her PhD in epidemiology and an MPH in maternal and child health from UC Berkeley. And in addition to serving as a principal investigator for numerous qualitative and quantitative research studies related to reproductive health, of course, she's uh, spoken extensively, both nationally and internationally. And then her work has been published, of course, in peer reviewed journals, as well as in the pro uh, popular press. And some of the publications that she included uh, were Biology of Reproduction, Stanford Social Innovation, uh, st excuse me, Stanford Social Innovation Review, the New York Times and Vogue. So as you can see, sure, her breadth is, um, is very wide and she um, speaks to many different types of audiences as well as funders. And we are so excited that she's going to be talking about some really cutting edge information with us here today. Thank you, Bethany. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. So can everyone see my screen, my slides? Yes. Okay, great. So it is such a pleasure to be here and to welcome everyone who's joined us today for this talk um, on something I am deeply passionate about, um, the promise of multi-purpose prevention technologies. Uh, I also want to really thank um, Ina Park and Elizabeth Olson for offering this space. Um, so my name, as Ina said, is Bethany Young Holt. Um, and uh, so since 2009, my organization, Cami Health, has served as the Secretariat for the Initiative for Multipurpose Prevention Technologies, or the IMPT, which is a global learning network that aims to advance multipurpose prevention technologies. And I'll be covering this a lot more, um, a lot more detail shortly. But I wanted to um, just go over with you, uh, propose a few um, learning objectives that I'm hoping folks will, will leave with. The first is to know the evidence um, showing the global need for, for products that simultaneously address multiple health risks, namely prevention of HIV, other STIs, or unintended pregnancy. Um, learning about the initiative for NPTs and the interactive tools that are available, um, including an NPT product development database, understanding the impact that NPTs could have on health and well-being, um, and how these risks overlap with, um, our, and how the promise of NPTs actually could overlap with other health priorities you might be working on, and then to identify ways that you might be able to help um, advance the field through your own work. So, um, you know, I'd like to begin today by ensuring that everyone is familiar with um, the definition of NPTs or multipurpose prevention technologies. NPTs are, are a relatively new class of products that deliver simultaneous prevention of at least two health risks, unintended pregnancy, HIV, and or other STIs. And this field really builds on nearly 50 years of contraceptive research and several decades of work um, in research in HIV prevention. Um, but it really formally emerged about, the NPT field emerged about 12 years ago to address the intrinsic links between these risks, unintended pregnancy, HIV, and other STIs, um, by developing single products with multiple indications. I think we all can recognize that due to funding and other challenges, these, these risks have traditionally been siloed um, until recently. So MPTs could, could be one-stop shop products that revolutionize sexual and reproductive health by incorporating STI prevention, including HIV prevention, into contraceptives, which uh, are less stigmatized, and could also reduce the burden of multiple clinic visits. So just imagine a single product that a person could use to prevent these, these intrinsic um risk, um, including unintended pregnancy, HIV, and even other STIs like herpes and chlamydia, which are really um, becoming increasing problems in the US and globally. 
So in my presentation today, I want to note that I'll be mainly talking about cis women because that's where the bulk of the research and development around MPTs has been done so far. Um, but these, these concerns um, really can affect trans men and non-binary people as well. Um, it's also you know, important to note that MPTs have different potential impacts and benefits, um, particularly with regard to reproductive health and empowerment, um, including destigmatizing HIV prevention. So before we go on, I want to just zoom out for a moment um, and, and really talk a bit about what, what really drove this MPT field. Um, women and adolescent girls are, um, have a simultaneous risk, um, interlinked risk for, for unintended pregnancy, HIV, and other STIs. Um, we also know that these risks fluctuate throughout the life stages and cultural contexts. That's emphasizing the need for a woman to have choice that meets their needs um, in different settings at any different at different times is really important. We also know that not one product for contraception or other STI prevention is going to be needed or used by women at all times of her life. Um, women want choice to help them make informed decisions about their health, including prevention um, of these risks. And this is especially critical for young women and adolescent girls who due to multiple factors, including sexual violence and barriers to accessing contraception, um, restrictive laws and access um, are often at higher risk for unintended pregnancy and HIV. Um, this is, um, you know, with, with the, the COVID pandemic, we're also seeing that the world is focusing more on universal health care and streamlining access to preventive health services. Um, and this has really underscored the need for more integrated or holistic care, like products like MPTs. So now we are going to um, ask you to answer a short poll. Um, so that we can uh, get to know who you all are. So um, the first question is, if you could answer, what is the main area in which you work? I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be managing the poll. Oh, you're good. Uh, okay. I'm about 80% there. 80% Perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay, almost 90%. Let me know. It's 114 out of 129. I think that's good. Okay, here, I'll end it and then I'll share the results. Great, thank you, Brian. Okay, so it looks like we have um, nearly 40, nearly 50% um, are practicing clinicians and then we have uh, another nearly 50% are active. Uh, the next question is if you could answer where, the, um, where your professional work is focused. Almost at 90% here. That's good, Brian. Okay. Okay, so it looks like the major, a little over 50% um, of those on the call are working in California with about 46% elsewhere in the US. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so let's now look at what's um, happening around the world um, that sort of sort of emphasizes the global need for MPTs. 
Um, HIV, AIDS, and other STIs, and unintended pregnancies remain critical public health issues, impacting lower and middle income countries as well as development, developed nations. Um, there are around 214 million women have an unmet need for family planning, um, with 89 million unintended pregnancies occurring every year. There's also, um, as you all know, um, globally, HIV remains a leading cause of death for, for women and men of reproductive age. Um, and this is particularly um, uh, the case in, in areas like Sub-Saharan Africa, where young women, adolescent girls are really bearing a brunt of HIV infections. Um, so what does this mean for young women? Um, there is evidence that every four minutes, three young women somewhere in the world are acquiring HIV. Uh, furthermore, each year there are over a million STIs occurring in reproductive age men and women. And um, you know, I do think it's really important again here to note that while these statistics exist for cis women, um, we don't really have good data on the burden of unintended pregnancy, HIV, H and other STIs for folks who identify as non-binary or, or trans men. So the implications, what, what does this mean? So we are seeing um, rise, a rise uh, in, in STIs globally, um, including antibiotic resistant STIs. Um, at the same time, unintended pregnancies are still a concern globally in the US. Nevertheless, condoms are the only available NPT currently um, on a, the market for combined prevention. Um, but more options are needed for prevention, especially options that women or receptive partners can control. So when looking at the map of the world, you'll see that um, here's a map that some colleagues from USAID uh, did a few years ago. Um, and you'll see that there is an overlap between different STIs, including HIV, HIV on this map is in different shades of green, and the unmet need for contraception. Um, and this really aims to highlight the need for new prevention products that address multiple health risks. Um, the need for HIV prevention and treatment continues. And, and one of the big challenges is funding. So UNAIDS recently launched, launched a new global AIDS strategy for 2001-2026, um, um, and in order to reach the HIV prevention goals for uh, 2025 is going to require an almost two-fold increase, an increase in resources from what we saw in 2025. Um, we're also seeing a rise in STI rates um, in women and men globally. And we know that many of these STIs uh, increase susceptibility to HIV in, in acquisition. We're also seeing the emergence of multi-drug resistant STIs causing a treatment crisis across the globe, um, reinforcing the need for, for better prevention. Uh, data also for, we also have data for both oral and injectable PrEP. Um, which are favorable for trans women. Um, and it also, the data also is looking good for injectable prep for cis women, but uh, oral and topical formulations have not demonstrated much success with cis women. So um, this slide um, really illustrates uh, that throughout history, the idea of safer sex has been the subject of a lot of curiosity and spark innovation. You know, we can go all the way back to around 3000 BC um, when uh, the, the uh, King Minos of Crete, um, Crete, Crete was said to have serpents and scorpions in the semen. And so reportedly he used goat bladder as a female condom to protect himself and his partners from disease. Um, advances in condom types have evolved over time, um, including in the 16th century with the Italian monk um, uh, Filippio, who described the use of linen sheets in preventing syphilis in men. Um, we also saw the, the launching of the female condom in 1994, and more recently, there's been growing advances in PrEP 
for HIV prevention, um, including a range of um, emerging delivery forms. So that's really exciting. At the same time, contraceptive research has shown that with increased contraceptive choice, um, contraceptive uptake increases, and this can lead to better, better health outcomes, including STI prevention and pregnancy. Um, there's data that shows um, that when women are given choice, um, they continue to, to use um, any kind of method overall. So now we're at a point where I think we can leverage these advances um, in contraception and HIV and bridge these silos between HIV prevention, STIs, and contraception. And NPT really um, provides an opportunity to revolutionize health um, and therefore the ability to pursue, uh, for people to pursue not only um, educational and, uh, and economic goals, um, but can, uh, can improve the whole status and well being of their family and their community. So, over the past decade, um, um, the NPT pipeline has grown to include a diverse array of product candidates. Um, this has been primarily with funding from USAID, um, the National Institutes of Health, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was also involved, um, and the Children's Investment Fund Foundation in the UK is, is starting to get involved in this field as well. Um, among the activities that my organization does is to track the NPT products and development with active funding. Um, we do this tracking exercise annually and we share the results, um, the outcomes of this in an online database on our website at npts101.org. Um, so I want to sort of give you now sort of a high level overview of what's in the pipeline. Um, it is a very dynamic field um, the, the, because the, the NPT candidates are largely funded by US government grants versus pharma. Um, um, the funding for this work tends to be in, in, you know, in, in sort of shorter cycles. So things can get funded for a few years and then there's benchmark criteria and then um, funding can continue um, or not. So some of the approaches currently in the pipeline are using innovative antibody-based technologies. Um, and there's also an increasing number of researchers looking at non-hormonal contraceptive op options that also can um, provide STI prevention. Uh, for the on-demand products, there are fast dissolving films, vaginal and rectal inserts, vaginal and rectal gels, all designed to address multiple risks. Um, there are new vaginal ring designs in development that provide different combinations of protection. Um, there are also uh, microarray patches and implant technologies. Um, there are also some what we call, like to call low-hanging fruit entities, um, and these can include combining two existing already approved FDA-approved products, um, like oral prep combined with oral contraceptives. Um, and this is being looked at as a, as a co-formulated um, or co-packaged single daily pill. Uh, the co-administered injections of uh, contraception, namely Depo Provera and HIV prevention, namely uh, long-acting Pevitegravir is also being explored. So here you'll see, um, on this slide, the, the array of uh, NPTs and development by delivery type. Um, as of June, and, and again, we are um, the, the tracking of the pipeline is ongoing, but as of just this week, <laughs> um, there are 27 NPT candidates in the pipeline. Um, and we are um, updating this on a, on a currently now. Um, Of the 27 products here, you'll see um, by indication, a uh, figure by indication and deliveries and development stage of the 27 that are in development, more than half combine HIV prevention with contraception and about a third provide pre uh, prevention against HIV and STIs but are not contraceptive. Uh, you'll also see um, in the figure on the right, that the majority of the products are in preclinical or early clinical stages with just a couple in advanced um, clinical stages. For example, 
the dual um, pill that I mentioned, um, as well as a, um, a gel called EVO 100, um, which combines, um, is looking to sort of leverage the non-hormonal uh, contraceptive that they have. Uh, it's now uh, under review by the FDA for chlamydia, chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, but you can, you can dig more into that on our website. So I want to now also give you a more of walk you through sort of the different delivery types, the different MPTs by delivery type um, that have been reported to us to date. So here you'll see um, a slide with the, the 11 intravaginal rings that are in development. On each of these slides, um, you'll see that the, the name of the product candidate is listed, the stage of development, and the indications. Um, there's, this is a lot of stuff on this slide, but it gives you an idea of, of what's in development. The majority you'll see here too are in um, preclinical stages of development, um, but you'll also see that there's a range of different um, indications that, that these candidates are targeting, um, including uh, you know, different combinations of STIs with pregnancy. Some are just targeting different STIs and HIV. Uh, some of the contraceptives are, are non-hormonal, whereas some are um, uh, hormonal. Uh, there are uh, five vaginal and rectal gels in development. Um, again, some including non-hormonal approaches uh, that also uh, aim to, to address different STIs. There are fast dissolving inserts. There are three currently in development. Um, all of these, well, two of these are in preclinical and one um, is in uh, a phase one clinical trial. You'll also see that there are films and enemas in development. Um, the enema is actually a relatively new one to our database, and it provides protection. It aims to provide protection from hepatitis, HIV, and HSV, and HSV2. And finally, this slide here um, uh, shows uh, you know, some other uh, delivery types that are in development, including subcutaneous implants, um, injections, uh, microarray patches. So basically these are um, uh, sort of leveraging a technology that has been used for delivery of other drugs for other diseases. And it's a, a patch that you put on the skin with, you know, can deliver the drug. And then again, the, the oral tablet or the dual prevention pill that I've mentioned. So um, yeah, if you want to dig deeper into what's in development, or if you know of something that's not yet included in, in the, the tables I just showed you, um, you can you can reach out to us. We can look around at our at our database. So now we're going to transition to another polling questions. Um, given what you've heard so far about NPTs, we'd be really curious to hear what. MPT indications would most benefit you or your patients. You know, one of the things that, you know, we do as the INPT is we work really closely with um, product developers and really, you know, so, so input, the end user research, I'll be talking about this a little bit further, is really important. And when I say end users, um, we also mean healthcare providers who are sort of at the, you know, at the cutting edge of, you know, and, in, in, you know, really at the... About 80% there. Pardon me? 80%. Okay, that's great. I guess okay. we can open it up, see what people are saying in terms of what you think an uh, ideal NPT would be for your people you see. So it's interesting. Okay, so um, HIV and other STIs, about 50%. Um, and then contraception and non HIV STIs is a priority too, about 50 50 there. Um, very interesting. Great. Thank you. One more question here for our poll. Um, which delivery types would most appeal to you um, and your patients as it falls on PT?
you know, and, and you know, the, this is a really uh, innovative field. So there may be uh, delivery types that'll come along in, in a year or so that we haven't even thought of yet. Okay. Curious to see what people say. 70% there, almost at 80. All right. And 80. Okay, I'll end it. Thank you. Okay, so oral tablets um, seems to be very appealing for, for this, for you all. Um, yeah, very interesting. Implants, fast dissolving inserts. Great, very interesting. Thank you for completing that. Um, so, you know, developing um, these SRH products that meet the needs of end users and introducing them into the market is needless to say, a long and winding road. <laughs> um, and so, you know, th that is sort of what sparked the, the launching of the initiative for, for multi-purpose prevention technologies. So like I mentioned, um, the, the INPT or the initiative for, for NPTs is a, um, we aim to foster an enabling environment for the successful advancement of NPTs. Um, and we are a global learning network that aims um, to do this. And we are the first and only initiative that's exclusively dedicated to advancing this field of NPTs. Um, so with this mission in, um, in support back in 2009, we bring together multidisciplinary stakeholders, and this includes funders or supporting agencies, product developers, social behavioral researchers, um, regulatory agencies um, from around the world to sort of um, uh, identify priorities and gaps and, and share information to advance this field. Um, our priority, our focus really prioritizes the needs and feedback of women and girls so that once available, NPTs will really re reflect the realities of their lives and be importantly be used. So upon the launching of the NPT field in 2009, the INPT was created as a product learning um, neutral body meaning that we have no horse in the race, so to speak, um, to help bring these silos between HIV, uh, prevention STI, and contraception. Um, and this graphic here shows um, um, the, the learning network model. As a central hub, our program really acts to um, gather and synthesize data from our network partners, uh, you know, information and data that can come into the hub and then disseminating it out to our partners and then facilitating connections between our partners, raising awareness and advocating for uh, increased resources. Um, in addition, we um, conduct assessments with multidisciplinary experts to inform field-wide priorities and gaps. Um, and in turn to um, this, this information can help inform our advocacy efforts. So in recognizing the identification of priority action areas and the progress to date, um, you know, and, and recognizing that this is an iterative process, um, we have synthesized the, the recommendations and, and the um, feedback from our, our stakeholders uh, to identify six field-wide action areas that we're working at this moment to address. Um, and this includes enhancing the product neutral platform as a comprehensive resource of our center of excellence to inform multidisciplinary partner efforts. 
um, improve guidance around technical approaches and regulatory requirements for combining um, active pharmaceutical ingredients and other technical um, challenges, toxicity issues, et cetera, particularly for early stage product developers. Um, so one of the, the, the challenges also for this field, as I mentioned, is that the, the majority of the products that are being developed right now are being developed by small biotech companies, um, academic spinoffs, um, and nonprofit product developers. But at this point, um, no large pharma is, is actively engaged. They're fortunately looking, you know, it, the momentum is growing and we're very hopeful that larger pharma will get involved. Um, but for that purpose, you know, the, the you know, the providing technical skills and information to these developers is really important. We're also working to stimulate an environment for NPT innovation. Um, um, and that means, uh, you know, in cre creating an in ecosystem. So uh, we're really working to foster training environments for new researchers and clinicians that are working in this space from in the US and globally. Uh, another priority is really to uh, integrate social behavioral and end user research to inform NPT research and development, and importantly, the introduction of, of these products once um, they become approved by the FDA. Uh, and then um, another uh, emerging issue and sort of an area that we're really interested in is understanding the role of cervical vaginal microbiome on um, STI acquisition, HIV acquisition, and also um, how this really uh, is can inform the um, successful development of NPTs. And then importantly, to optimize investments for the field. So one of the things that we do as part of the initiative for NPTs is to host webinars. Um, uh, that address technical issues that, that could be, you know, resources for, for researchers and clinicians. And, and some of the topics that we've been um, really focused on in the past uh, 10 months or so is um, we had a webinar on cervical vaginal microbiome with Shaq Ravel, who I'm sure many of you know who are working in this space. Um, inter we had a webinar on integrating social behavioral research with leading behavioral researchers in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, also toxicity study considerations. And, and all of these are available on our website. So, you know, to really move this field forward really is going to require um, an array of data, um, not only for the product R&D to ensure that NPTs are safe and effective, but also end user data. Um, to ensure that they are used and, and that once they are developed, they'll be um, available um, and used by and introduced appropriately into the communities that need them. Um, and all this data is also really critical for scaffolding the advocacy efforts to stimulate and support innovation. I want to um, spend just a couple minutes um, giving you an idea of the type of data that is being used. Um, to advance this field. So uh, there's epidemiological data, there's um, um, story mapping data, uh, end user data. So as an example of um, some epidemiological data and uh, that we've been using is we developed um, uh, an NPT using uh, GIS. We developed a, a target population identification mapping tool uh, using epidemiological data on HIV prevalence and the total addressable market for contraceptives um, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, namely uh, 14 sub-Saharan African countries. And you'll see here that this tool then identifies where are the hot spots at sort of a, a, a small geographical unit are for total addressable market for contraceptives, that's, that's in blue, um, HIV uh, in red, and then where these areas overlap is, um, you'll see in this uh, uh, areas in, in brown, those are where, um, if you're looking at this map, the, the second one from the end. Um, and, and this data then can be used 
to inform where the most appropriate end user research should be done. Um, we know that uh, adolescent girls and young women in Sub-Saharan Africa are um, bearing the brunt of HIV infections, but this is also a very heterogeneous population. So if we can hone in and focus in on the communities which are, are most impacted and understand what they need and um, that can really help inform successful product development. As a next step on this, we are collaborating with some partners at the University of Witswaterstrand in South Africa on a story mapping activity. So we are um, uh, working with them to go into some of these hotspot communities uh, to um, uh, video, take videos and, and really uh, uh, sort of integrate in the voices of the end users and the researchers and the product of, and, the, and the clinicians that are in these communities to help make the data come to life. So um, stay tuned for that. We hope to have that done in a couple months. There's also an uh, increased uh, recognition of the role of uh, social behavioral research, as I've mentioned. There have been a, an array of different types of market end user research studies that have been done over the past um, 10 or so years that really can inform the field. Um, so this includes uh, the bulk of these studies have been done with women in Sub-Saharan Africa, but there have been some NPT preference studies in the US. And I believe there is one ongoing now, at least uh, one or a couple more ongoing right now. Uh, the Male Contraceptive Initiative um, is also, uh, has also conducted a market research study that, that looked at the potential um, sort of end user preferences for an NPT for, um, for men. So just to sort of walk you through a little bit um, you know, of what this data is looking like, there was a study conducted by Ipsos Healthcare a few years ago um, that aimed to assess the acceptability of NPTs among women in Uganda, Nigeria, and South Africa. And the key objectives were to understand women's sexual behavior, their attitude towards contraception, HIV, and to gauge the level of acceptability for four NPT candidates, um, injectables, implants, intravaginal films, intravaginal ring. Um, overall, um, the data from this study showed that there was a uh, nearly 92% of the women were interested in an NPT. Um, but what you'll see here and what the study also showed is that um, uh, more than one NPT would be needed to, to, to really to, um, optimize coverage for all women. In other words, women in different parts of the world there, there's not have varying needs and desires. And, and so there's going to, just like contraceptives, uh, there's going to need to be an array of NPT candidates available. Uh, the TRIO study was conducted, there was also several studies some, um, conducted by RTI International, including TRIO and, and Quattro. Um, but I wanted to sort of highlight this TRIO study here. Um, it looked at the preferences for long-acting injectables among women in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and, um, um, and this looked at end users, inc including women and healthcare providers. Uh, and the trio targeted women in South Africa and Kenya and looked at three different placebo products. Um, similar to the Ipsos Healthcare, um, there was a strong uh, preference among women for a combination product that combined HIV prevention and um, uh, contraception. And there was a particular uh, interest in co-administration of injectables, so long-acting products that could be injected. Um, what, what TRIO also found was um, that some clinicians uh, were concerned about uh, increased clinic burden when they were trying to, you know, if you're trying to introduce, you know, HIV prevention and family planning in the same clinic. Um, you know, these are issues that I think are really important no matter what, you know, wherever you are to think about in the U.S. as well. Um, 
and WHO and others are, you know, there's been a lot of discussion on integrated healthcare with best practices advised. Um, healthcare providers also noted that they would need to get uh, additional training for counseling, uh, you know, when, when they're combining one of these products and integrating the services. So, you know, I want to also sort of wrap up a bit by saying that the, you know, the emphasizing the majority of the PT that are in development and the end user research is supported right now by the US government. Um, and this has been, you know, incredibly valuable, but there is a need to mobilize uh, private sector funding to uh, complement the, the, the funding that the NIH and USAID um, in particular are putting into this work, um, and also to mobilize uh, other types of foundation support and other funding to, to support this field. Um, really important is, you know, you know, as you all are researchers and clinicians, you know, and probably familiar with how the funding works when, when people get NIH grants, is, you know, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, you know, oftentimes a product developer will get, you know, funding for certain stages of their product development and there needs to be um, leverage, you know, mobilizing other kinds of funding sources to secure end-to-end -end funding um, for this work so that at the end of the day, there's not big gaps in their research that the developers are doing because that can really sort of slow things down or, you know, be devastating for the work that they're doing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of effort that we're doing as the INPT and others um, are doing, working with funders around the world to raise awareness uh, and uh, engage into this field. Uh, there's also efforts and in, in more interest we're excited to see from pharma. So fingers crossed that pharma, big pharma will get involved in this field too soon. So, um, you know, there's a, I want to also point out if you are interested in, in getting more involved in this work, the, the INPT has a website that really has different resource hubs within the website. So the product the, um, database, there's also learning events with webinars and other tools, um, you know, for, for you know, doing a deeper dive um, and also uh, connecting with other resources, researchers working in this space. We're also very keen um, and excited to look for opportunities for trainees and, and, um, and other career resources that can, you know, enable newer researchers and others to get involved in this space space and funding opportunities. Um, there's also, uh, you know, tools for advocacy. Uh, so we encourage you to, to really think about how, you know, your work, the work that you do might align with NPTs um, and get involved if there's uh, opportunities. So we also encourage you to connect with us on our website or by email. Uh, and there is uh, contact information on this slide. So with that, I think um, I can uh, hand it over to Ina um, for discussion. All right, Bethany, thank you so much. Um, I am just looking so forward to the day when we can have you back to say, we have a product that's ready to go. Um, I will be Me very too. excited for that day. <laughs> yeah. um, so before I get into, so uh, people on the, uh, on the webinar, please put your questions in the q and I have a few compiled. And I just wanted to ask a clarification question about the slide immediately before this, Bethany, for um, our audience. If folks, yes. So if folks actually go on to the MPT learning events, are they able to then like, for example, register for your mailing list? And in case you do make an announcement, for example, of an MPT product that's uh, ready to go, or if you need, for example, clinical sites to, you know, get end user input on a, on a product, for example, 
-hmm. would they, if they go through the MPT learning events and sign up for your mailing list, would that be a good way to, um, yes. you know, to stay in touch about those notifications? Yeah, okay. definitely. And, um, you know, the, the, the website is a, it's an iterative tool. So as the field is advancing, if, um, you know, there are, you know, opportunities that you all think, you know, this could be really, this would be a really cool thing to include in the, in this tool. We're, we're very open to that. Um, yeah. So all of the learning events, the webinars, um, they're free, <laughs> open source. Great. That's wonderful. So another, another place if you guys want to do continuing education and, and I think one thing that's important to note is that um, and you've said it before to me, and you said it before on this webinar, but that you are not rooting for any one particular product or throwing, you know, your uh, vote behind anyone. You are just really trying to keep everybody speaking and communicating yeah. and in the loop, because as you know, these uh, organizations and subject areas are often very siloed. So I think that's yeah. a, that's a great, uh, it's a great thing to emphasize to folks is that, yeah. you know, you don't have any particular interest in one of these. You would just like anything valuable to make it out to market. Yeah. Um, so I have several questions and they're coming in, uh, they're coming in quickly. So okay. a couple, a, a couple questions from Eric Tang who noted it seemed like many of the MPTs were, that were being co-formulated for a non-HIV STI appear to be mostly related to HSV2. And um, so I think one of the questions to add on to that is, is that because it's easier to co-formulate two antivirals together, for example, or is it based on the fact that end user, you know, data has suggested that HSV is the greatest need based on prevalence. I'm just curious, Bethany, why many of the products you showed seem to be HSV2 focused. Yeah. Um, so at least some of these candidates are using tenofovir mm -hmm. in, in their formulation. And tenofovir has not only an HIV indication, but the HSV2. Right. So that that's, you know, practically speaking, that's, that's one reason. Yeah. Um, and then HSV2 is also, as we all know, a, a really big problem globally in terms of infection. Yeah. And then a question also from Eric Tang was about the uh, non HSV2, um, you know, uh, MPT being examined for uh, GCCT and the mechanism of action. Um, around that particular method. I'm trying to think which one you're talking about. I think he's talking about EvoFEMS, um, you know, ah. the, the Fexi gel. Okay. Yeah, so that one, if it's the EvoFEM product. Um, yeah, there you are. This one right here. <laughs> um, yeah, so that is uh, using a, sort of a, it's, a lac it's it's, La it's yeah. looking at lactobacilli it's really sort of leveraging sort of so fexi is now approved you can buy it um it's a non-hormonal method and really how it works is it uh, it uh, sort of alters the, the it's looking at the vaginal ph and yeah and they've also found that and the fda is now looking at how that also might um uh, the effectiveness for glamidia and gonorrhea um, can, so actually, I, I know in your book, which I loved, um, you wrote a lot about this. So I'll, you, you might want to ex expand on that a little bit too. Yeah, I just wanted to add a tiny bit to, um, to that, Bethany, about, you know, the lactic acid and citric acid are one of the, are two of the primary ingredients for that particular product. And so you were right. It's worth really working to um, optimize vaginal pH in that sense. And, you know, it looks about as, um, efficacious as condoms. So it's not an amazing, it's not, you know, it's not as good as an IUD, for example, but it will be, it's, it's fast tracked for FDA approval. And if it does get an indication for GCCT, um, you and I have talked about this, Bethany, it'll be one of the first products since the latex condom, which, you know, the condom has been around for thousands of years, but the latex condom has been around for over a hundred years. So yeah. we haven't had a multi-purpose prevention product uh, for, you know, for STIs and contraception other than the condom for a long time. So I think that would be exciting. And the company will also get five years of exclusive um you know, time to market their product, which incentivizes them to stay in the market um, 
and develop this because obviously a lot goes into the R&D. So I think it's, it's exciting. I think it's exciting. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. So, you know, since yeah. it's fast tracked for FDA approval, I'm hoping we'll see something, you know. Yeah. And, nice. you know, to build on that and, you know, Yaza gel and there's some others too that are non-hormonal, but, right. you know, are really, even if the efficacy isn't as great as a hormonal method like LMG, it's going to meet the need for women who can't use a hormone. That's and right. Now aren't using nothing. Um, that's right. You know, so, and, and the other interesting thing, I think that's, I think I find it interesting and exciting about Evofem and there are a couple others in here, but they're, um, they have private sector funding. Yeah. So they're on the NASDAQ and, you know, so that is just promising for where the field can go. I mean, I, I hear a lot, oh, where well, you're working in this space, it's so niche, it's women's health, nobody's going to fund it. But, um, you know, there's a growing, there's growing momentum and interest from some uh, investors to get into this space and there needs to be a lot more. Um, but, you know, the, the target market for some of, you know, for, for Evofem, in contrast to some of the other entities in development are US women. Um, Yaza is right. another example. And so, you know, their strategy is let's look at a you know, a potential market that's lucrative, if you will. Yeah. Um, and then they're, they're from that going to see how they can, um, you know, expand into to other parts of the world where um, there's a, a tremendous need, but might have to have a different payer model. Yeah. And um, so just uh, Jennifer Bryson Alderman gives a vote. Her thumbs up for a GCCT plus contraception would be super helpful for her youth patients. So you're getting a vote of confidence there. And um, I have a question then from Susan George, who is asking, how do you, Bethany, actually communicate to foundations, you know what I mean, and potential funders regarding these products? So like, you know, you're saying you're trying to corral all these people and get and keep them in conversation and engage with each other. How do you reach out to foundations regarding products that might be coming on the pipeline to try to see if you can garner additional investment, for example? Yeah, so there's a couple ways I could answer that question. So one of the things that we do as the INPT is we have a supporting agency collaboration committee. And so this committee actually brings together the, the private sector and public sector funders that are interested in NPTs. Um, and so brings them together a couple of times a year as a platform for them to talk and, and really look at opportunities to leverage each other's funding. And you know, so this includes some newer private sector investors and the NIH, you know, how can a private sector investor come in and support, you know, where there might be a gap. In terms of um, reaching out to newer funders, um, I just try to get in their faces as much as possible. So <laughs> going to, you know, the funder, women's funder networks, the platforms where funders might, where they might be coming. Um, JP Morgan's Chase, you know, has these different platforms for funders. Um, you know, several years ago, we were funded by the Gates Foundation to try to optimize funding in Europe. So literally did a little roadshow with to different European funders. Um, you know, but one of the challenges I'll say is um, for this field overall is, de is demonstrating an investment potential, a market potential for these products. The private sector, the way you message and advocate to a public sector funder, um, where you could, you know, it's like you're going at it from the public health need, you know, you can save lives, whereas going, you know, messaging and advocating to a private sector funder um, takes different messaging and also needs more like a business case, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. So, and that's actually a gap in the field. So we're working on that with the developers. Hopefully yeah. that answers your questions. Um, it's a challenge. So welcome any suggestions that you have of any foundations that might be interested. <laughs> and um, so Bethany, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this question and um, and I actually don't. So we, we will tap into the hive mind of our audience and ask someone to put it in the q and if they, if they do know, but you probably realize um, that you know, Descovy, um, you know, Gilead's other product for HIV prep wasn't really tested for uh, receptive vaginal sex and whether or not it could be used as prep, uh, you know, for that, for that indication. And uh, the question from Jennifer Backer was whether or not you, if you knew whether or not that research was being conducted to look at Descovy for receptive vaginal sex, because obviously they did it with 
uh, Truvada, but um, whether or not it's being done with their other product, Descovy. You know, I'd hate, I think so. Um, and I actually he hesitate to say for sure, but I know that there has been a lot of discussion around that. Yeah. Um, around Huge backlash need. up and Huge. upset about that. <laughs> and if anyone knows, by the way, put it in the Q and A. Yeah. If you have heard, if you can verify that those studies are going on, please put it in the Q and A. Um, and then a question from Remy Newman. I realize part of the focus is on contraception, but if we have technology to prevent STIs, and aside from PrEP for HIV prevention, um, are these being researched as well for MSM where there are high rates of STI? So like multi-purpose yeah. prevention for MSM. Have you heard anything about that? Then? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, I'll, so when this initiative started, it was small and we had to make the decision, you know, what can we do and do it well? Um, and so the, therefore the focus was on um, women, HIV prevention and contraception for women. As the field has evolved, um, you know, there, a lot of these technologies can be, you know, the, 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 the research is being leveraged for MSM too. So, um, you know, you'll see, and I think you're seeing my screen here, but you know, there's an enema, there rectal enema, there are different products and database now that are being looked at, you know, they'll have to be looked at, you know, the trials and whatnot will have to be looked at, you know, in accordance mm -hmm. to what's appropriate. But to answer your question, yes. Um, yeah, and there, there's some, um, yeah, some partners that we're working with that are, you know, that are like the rectal Irma um, and some other groups I know are, are really pushing this too, so. Great. And uh, Robin Krasiak, thank you very much. Robin says, yes, the studies of um, Discovery for vaginal sex are going on in Africa. So thank you for verifying. Uh, so Kami um, Saya Sang was asking from, from your experience and the end user research that you've looked at, Bethany, mm -hmm. which um, formulation of MPTs is sort of most desired, um, you know, for patients in terms of you know, the, the most effective MPT will be the one that people will actually use, right? Yeah. And so I'm curious what end users have said. And I know from that, some of the Sub-Saharan Africa data you showed that they did not like, people did not like vaginal rings, but what did, pe what did people like, I guess? Well, and I'll say to the, to the vaginal ring issue is that what was interesting is that those studies were done several years ago when, and it looks like the reason rings came, you know, were low was because women didn't know about them in a lot of these places. So it'll be interesting once, you know, the, the rings are actually, probably, you know, there's a lot of advances in rings right now. So it'll be interesting to see how people's preferences change once there is an actual product that they can use. Um, you know, what we were seeing, you know, the, I, the, the trio fact sheet, and I would encourage you, um, you know, on our website, we have an, an RTI actually did the study, but, uh, you know, there, there's a really nice fact sheet here that summarizes their, their findings. And what it really was showing was that long acting products seem to be preferred mm -hmm. um, overall uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that injections um, are really something that people are interested in as well. And, and a lot of that has to do with just, you know, not having to worry about, you know, using something daily or monthly or messy. Um, so, so that's sort of where the, the, you know, data, what data is looking like, but to that point, we're seeing that there is no one method that's going to be, you know, people are going to change, you know, just like contraceptives. I mean, it's so similar to contraceptives. And what we also have learned so much from contraceptives is that, you know, when people have in the communities where there's a, a lot of choice and different options, there's greater uptake overall in contraceptives. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would suspect that that'll be the case, you know, when we can have different options for NPTs available for, for STI prevention and, and um, other and contraceptives in combination products. Yeah, and I think those of us who take care of patients know that, you know, some folks love taking a pill every day and don't have any yeah. problem with it. Some folks absolutely cannot handle that and would much rather have an injection. And it's just, you know, it, people have lots of different opinions. And so I hear what yeah. you're saying in terms of more choice means more choice, more options means, you know, more likelihood, greater likelihood that someone will actually try something, yeah. you know, rather than just sort of sitting it out. 
Um, I did see that it was interesting in this poll with you all that it looked like uh, oral pills were a preferred option, mm -hmm. which um, so I, I I noted that because the bulk of the end user research has been done in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I think that there's so much opportunity to do more of that research here as well yeah. in the US. Absolutely. Um, another question. So I think that's uh, if you have any other user questions out in the audience, please, um, you know, put them into the chat. I wanted to ask one question, Bethany, about whether or not um, any of the products seem to, you know, I'm thinking in particular, some of the rings that might be further along in the development stage has shown, you know, effects on bacterial vaginosis, for example, or, um, you know, negative effects on the cervical microbiome. I'm wondering if, you know, if with some of these products you've seen increased incidence of BV, for example, in some of these studies? You know, I'm not aware of, um, of that data. I think it's a really exciting, important question. Um, I, trying to think if the, the copper um, IBR, that's the first one on this table here, if they're looking at that. I, um, this is done by a team at UC Davis um, up here where my neck of the woods. Um, so, you know, but I, I, I'm actually really interested. I'm going to look into that. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I'm um, just wondering, not every product would necessarily, I mean, not every ring or whatever would necessarily look at impact on microbiome, right? But some of them do. Is that what I'm understanding? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, and a lot of these rings too, I'll just note they're, they're, um, there's not one single type of ring. So they have different polymers, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're, yeah. So they, you know, there's copper, different polymers, even, even like the Depivirin ring and the Tenofovir ring, um, you know, our different ring formulae of compounds. So in terms of the actual source material made to use the, the, mm -hmm. the structure, interesting. Yep. All right, I think we got one more question in the chat. Um, Oh, you know what, Lee, I, I, uh, this person may have missed your answer about the status of MPTs for men. And I think if you mm -hmm. said that there were some rectal gels in, um, in development, can you show that slide yeah. if you have it? Rectal right here. And, and an enema as well. And an enema right here. But everything's early, right, Bethany, for, in terms of M MPTs that might be used by men who have sex with men yeah, or trans, I mean, trans I women. Think that most advanced is phase one clinical. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So everything's early. Yeah. And then of course, you know, there are studies looking at uh, things like, you know, oral doxycycline um, as post-exposure prophylaxis, but not being proposed right now as a sort of MPT co-formulated with PrEP or anything like that, but really yeah. as two separate uh, products. Okay, um, I think that is our last question. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Otherwise I'm going to wrap it up. So I'm looking in the q and I don't see any questions and answers. I'm gonna take this opportunity to sincerely thank um, Bethany for all the work you're doing, um, trying to herd the cats and get them to talk to each other and um, trying to just move this whole pipeline along. Um, I, I think it's great you're doing such a great service. To, uh, to women and folks around the world. And I just wanted to say thanks to everybody for coming to this Expert Hour webinar series. We are going to keep these going, uh, even though the pandemic is ending and we are going to start doing in-person events. Um, we've had great attendance at these. We're gonna keep these going. We'll be doing one on the uh, forthcoming STI treatment guidelines. They will be out by the end of July. So stay tuned, we'll be uh, doing a webinar on that, which will include myself and perhaps another speaker. We'll be talking about health equity and racism in sexual health care with Leo Moore in October. So we have a great lineup of uh, future uh, expert hour webinars. Please, please, please do your evaluation by July 1st so that you can get CME if you'd like to. And Bethany has left her contact information here, including their uh, social media, um, handles and go to their website and please sign up to join their learning community so you can learn more about MPTs and be uh, ready when, the, when one is uh, ready to hit the market.
And uh, Lisa Papa asked, is this recorded? And it is recorded. We will be posting the recording on our website in case you missed the beginning because you were busy or doing something else. So you can catch the uh, beginning information. Um, we will post a link on our website. We will let you know when that happens. We will be sending out the slides to everybody who registered for this event as well. We have to remediate them to make sure that they are ADA compliant or 508 compliant. And so once we do that, we will send that out to folks. So please do your evaluation by July 1st. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Thank you.